Well, it is good to see you tonight. And I would ask, please, that we look to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15. And we read, beginning with verse 35, we will read down to verse 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. And each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust, the second man is from heaven. And as was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we can sing praises to you from our hearts, giving you glory, Lord, recognizing your glory, who you are, and thanking you for what you've done for us in your Son, our Savior. And thank you that we have your word, and that tonight as we gather around your word, your spirit is present in our lives to teach us. Our Savior walks in our midst and meets with us. And Lord, your work will be accomplished in the lives of your children tonight in this place and in this hour. We thank you for that. We also, Lord, pray for anyone here with us tonight who doesn't know you. Our desire and our prayer is for their salvation. Lord, you are able to raise the dead spiritually. And we ask, even on their behalf tonight, that, Lord, you would do a spiritual work of resurrection in them and bring them to life through faith in your son Jesus. Bless this time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The beginning place for wisdom is to know that you need wisdom. The way you grow in the Christian life is to realize that you are always in need. Always in need of being conformed to the image of your Savior. Always in need of the teaching ministry of the Spirit in your life, always in need of growth. This, this is the key to sanctification, humility. Humility. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Humility means that you are ready to be taught. It means that you don't assume that you have all the answers. It means that we understand the weakness of our own understanding that we don't place confidence in us, that we recognize that 
our own thoughts, if left to ourselves apart from Christ, are absolutely untrustworthy. That the only way for us to think soundly, for us to see things accurately, for us to live in a way that glorifies God, is to recognize our absolute dependence on the words of God. I love what David read earlier tonight from Psalm 19. That, that needs to be our perspective. That the only sure thing in this world is what God has revealed to be true. Humility recognizes that. And so we live our lives recognizing not only the frailty of our own thinking, but the absolute deception of our own thinking if we think in a way that doesn't agree with Scripture. So humility is the way to growth. But, but we face a danger sometimes in the Lord's church with a wrong understanding of what humility means. Humility means that we're teachable, but it doesn't mean that we're open to just anything. Humility means that we will let others teach us, but it doesn't mean that we'll just let anyone teach us. In fact, it is the height of arrogance and pride to think, whether it's ourselves or anyone who would want to pass something on to us, it is pride to think that anyone would have anything that we should want to receive if what they're trying to give us disagrees with Scripture. Just as we don't trust our own thinking apart from God's Word, so we don't trust anyone's thinking apart from the truth of God's Word. It's not humility to be open to everything. That's pride. Now, I raise this tonight because of the way that this section begins. You notice how Paul begins in verse 35? He says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And for anyone who's had questions about the resurrection, for anyone who's had questions about heaven, when you first read that, it doesn't sound like something so bad, does it? In fact, it probably represents questions you have had, questions I have had. How does God do this thing called resurrection? And when we're raised from the dead, what, kind of, what, will, our, what will our body be like? I mean, those questions don't seem out of line. But you notice how Paul responds, verse 36? He says, you foolish person. In fact, uh, English translations tend to soften the blow a little bit. I mean, he's just calling them a fool. Whoever would raise this question, he calls them a fool. It is sharp. It is terse. It is firm. Fool. And we have to ask, why would he say that? I mean, why would he respond this way? Remember something, he's dealing with an imaginary questioner anyway, isn't he? He's, Paul is the one anticipating this question. And so what we recognize is, as Paul anticipates this question, he's basing it on the attitude of some in the Corinthian church. He's thinking about those who have denied the bodily resurrection of believers. We've already seen in this chapter there were some saying there will be no resurrection. And he understands that the attitude that lies behind the question is not an honest one. It's not someone, you know, really just wanting to know God's answers about this. Rather, the spirit behind this question is one of skepticism. I don't really believe in a resurrection. I don't really know why God would, would do such a thing as resurrection. And so, sort of in the spirit of mocking and in the spirit of skepticism... Paul envisions them saying something like, well, you know, if, if this is the case, how are they raised? What kind of body do they have? Now, informing this attitude would be pagan philosophy, which took that which is material to be inferior to that which is immaterial. So for someone being influenced by pagan philosophy, they would see no need for a bodily resurrection. Why do you need a body? There's nothing good about a body, nothing good about the material realm. In addition, they probably thought of resurrection in these terms, that the body you're going to be raised with is basically the same body that you've had in this life. So the body that's going to be raised is in no way different than the body we just put in the ground. What kind of a body is it? The same kind of body? Why do we need that? That would be the attitude. 
So Paul is responding not just to the question, but the attitude behind the question, the skepticism, the unbelief that was already present in the Corinthian church, and he says, you are foolish. And he's going to explain why. And in that way, Paul would not yield even for a moment to someone whose thinking, whose teaching conflicted with what the Bible teaches about this subject. You see, if you think you are wise when you deny bodily resurrection, you are indeed a fool because what you are holding to is contrary to what the Scriptures teach. And this is what he's about to demonstrate. And beloved, I would just say to us tonight, we've got to have the same attitude. That we recognize the only thing that's wise in this world is what the Bible says. And anything that would disagree with it or conflict with it, that is foolishness. So he begins by identifying the foolish question. How were the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. By the way, we remember that there's something similar to this in the life of our Lord when he was here on the earth, right? Mark chapter 12, verse 18 is just one example of it. And Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Right? The kinsman redeemer concept. Well, they say there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise. And the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. So they're just introducing a hypothetical to Jesus. And then they think they have him. Verse 23, in the resurrection, since you believe in resurrection, Jesus, in the resurrection, when they rise again, Whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as a wife. Mocking him with the question, right? Trying to embarrass him, trying to make his view look foolish. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God? He just says to them, You're fools. You don't know the Word of God, and you don't know the power of God. Well, basically, folks, that's what Paul is saying right here in chapter 15. He's, he's going to introduce some things, and he's saying to them in an extended fashion, you don't know the Word of God, and you have left out of the equation the power of God. Jesus went on to say this, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Jesus picks up there on the present tense language that was used by God. I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So Jesus said this, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Right? Not I was the God of Abraham, but I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So the Corinthians who would ask this question of Paul, they would have considered themselves to be wise. They would have thought that they were open to some kind of higher knowledge and, and some kind of superior teaching that would make nonsense out of the resurrection, make it unnecessary. And Paul says, you are not wise as you imagine. You are not superior in your views. When you disagree with Scripture, you are foolish. That's what he's saying to them. But now he doesn't just call them foolish. In verses 36 through 41, he demonstrates their foolishness. He demonstrates the foolishness of the contention that resurrection doesn't make sense. Notice what he says in verse 36. You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And by the way, it seems, it appears that in verse 36, you there is emphatic. When he says what you sow it does not come to life unless it dies. Literally, you could read it. You, what you sow, 
does not come to life unless it dies. You, what you sow. In other words, Paul is saying, you have the answer to your foolish question in your own hand. I want you to think about sowing and reaping. I want you to think about planting and harvesting. I want you to think about what happens when you sow seed. You have the answer in your own hand about resurrection if you'll just think about it. You, what you sow, does not come to life unless it dies. So here's the first thing Paul does. By the way, as we look at these verses, what he's doing is this. He's going to demonstrate how resurrection works through some analogies. And the first analogy he gives us has to do with seed. Let's read it all together and then we'll we'll comment on it. You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. And to each kind of seed, its own body. This is the first analogy, how seed how planting operates. Now he makes several points in this analogy, doesn't he? First of all, he makes the point that when you talk about planting and harvesting, death is necessary. Death must precede this new life. He says in verse 36, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. It's a mystery, isn't it? You take a seed and you put it in the ground... And when you put it into the ground, notice he says it's bare. Verse 37, what you sow is not the body that is to be, but it's a bare kernel. Or you could even say it's naked. In this sense, there's nothing in that seed that gives you a picture of what it's about to become. I mean, it's just a seed. And it's absolutely bare in the sense that what its clothing is going to be after the process, it's not wearing yet. You can't see it. So you take this bare seed and you put it into the ground, and what happens to the seed? It dies. It, um, it disintegrates, in a sense. And out of that process comes new life. Out of the death of the seed comes the plant It comes up out of the ground and begins to mature until it's fully what it was meant to be in seed form. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies, verse 37. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but it's a bare kernel. Maybe you're talking about wheat or some other grain. But now notice the second thing he points out about this. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. That's, that's powerful to my mind. And I, I don't want us to miss this. That when Paul looks at something like planting a seed and a plant coming up out of it, you notice he attributes that to God, doesn't he? This is not just happening by itself. This is not just nature operating on its own. When you put a seed in the ground and a plant comes up, it's a mystery. And the only thing that explains why putting that seed in the ground would would result in wheat or some other grain, the only explanation for that is, it's what God has chosen to do. It's a process that God put into existence and still carries on. It doesn't go on by itself. God is actively involved in the planting of seed and the plant that results afterwards. It ends up being what God has chosen for it to be. It ends up with the body that God has chosen for it. So death must precede the new life, and the process can only be explained by God's purpose and by God's power. But there's something else in this analogy. He says in verse 38, But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Even though you're putting these seeds in the ground and you can't see what they're going to become, what they ultimately become is tied to what you put in the ground. 
You don't put a certain kind of seed in the ground and get a different kind of plant. Whatever kind of seed you put in the ground, that's the kind of new life, that's the kind of plant that comes out of it. Each seed produces after its own kind, which is to say there is a definite connection between the life that was present in the seed and the life that is present in the plant. It's the same life. The form is different. But it's connected. There is continuity. There's a connection between the first life and the second life, between what it was and what it's going to be. There's a connection there. And yet, there's another principle in this analogy, and that is that the new life is definitely different than the first life. Even though there's a connection, each seed produces after its kind, it is still true to say that the body that the plant knows is not what the seed was. It's connected, but the new life is different. Now, all of this is true of the resurrection. What a wonderful analogy. All of this is true of the resurrection. When, we, when, we, when someone dies and their body is put in the ground... That doesn't rule out resurrection. I, I think sometimes even, even believers, we worry about things that reflect that we don't really understand the power of God. We don't really take into account the power of God. I'll just put it to you very, very plainly. It is no problem for God who spoke everything into existence, right? Everything came into being on nothing but the Word of God. It is no problem for God to take our bodies after they have been buried in the ground, after they have disintegrated, after there's been decay. It is, it is no problem for God to reconstitute and transform those bodies. No problem at all. And in fact, if you wonder, and this is his point, if you wonder about the power of God to do that, realize there are many resurrections going on every day in the plant world. <laughs> when seeds are put in the ground and they die, and out of that seed comes new life. If you want to see resurrection, just look at the plant world, and it's happening all the time. It's no problem for God. So death doesn't rule out resurrection. And if, if someone's, you know, body is exploded or in some way, you know, uh, their death is not what we would expect and we wonder about the resurrection, we just don't understand the power of God. It's no problem for God. Death must precede the new life. That's true of the resurrection. The process of resurrection, what God does in resurrection, it can only, it's a mystery. It can only be explained by God's purpose, by God's power. There is continuity. Your present body will have a definite connection to your resurrection body. The first life is not completely disconnected from the next life. When Christ was raised from the dead and eyes were opened to be able to do so, they recognized him, didn't they? They were able to recognize our Lord. They were able to recognize even the wounds in His hand and His side. There was a definite connection between the body that Jesus had before He was crucified and before He was put in a tomb and the body that He had after He was raised from the dead. There was continuity and yet, it is true to say, there was a major difference. When you look at Christ post-resurrection, all of a sudden He's able to move places... Without any reference to time or distance, he's able to appear in a room without walking through the door. And yet he's able to be touched and he's able to eat. He's able to demonstrate this is really, you know, flesh. This is really a body. And yet he had these amazing capacities that would not be true of the natural body. So a connection to the first life yet completely different in many ways. This is the first analogy that he uses to demonstrate their thinking is woefully underestimating what God has determined to do. But notice he moves to now a second analogy. The analogy of seed, that's the first one. The second one is the analogy of animate bodies. 
the bodies of people and the bodies of animals. Look at what he says, verse 38. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Verse 39, for not all flesh is the same. But there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Do animals have real bodies? Yes. Do fish have real bodies? Yes. Do birds have real bodies? Yes. Do we have real bodies? Yes. Are they the same? Absolutely not. Real bodies differ. Even in the natural realm they differ. And we would not deny the real physical nature of various kinds of life. Even though each has its own unique flesh after its kind, according to God's will, it doesn't make any of them less real. Why would he use this analogy? Because he's wanting us to understand that the resurrection body is going to be a real physical body even though its nature is going to be different than the body you have right now. But just because it's different doesn't mean it's less human. Just because it's different won't mean that it's less real. Even in the same way in the natural realm right now, you have different kinds of bodies, but they're all real physical bodies. Now he moves to a third analogy. The analogy of inanimate bodies. Verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. God spoke everything that is into existence. It was all originally good. It all reflects His glory. But there's a real difference between earth, planet earth, and everything else that's out there. This planet is absolutely, perfectly designed for the life that exists on it. And there's a certain splendor to the earthly. Things that reflect the glory of God. The mountains and the valleys and the rivers and the oceans and all the things that belong to this planet that uniquely tell some kind of truth and some kind of story about the nature and character of God. But in the same way, there are bodies in the heavens that also have their own splendor. Just because the splendor or the glory of the earthly is different from the glory of the heavenly doesn't make it any less a real entity. The bodies in heaven are as real as the earth itself, though the glory differs. And by the way, even when you talk about bodies existing in the same realm, in the heavenlies, there's a different glory from one to the other. The sun is not the same as the moon, and the moon is not the same as the stars. There's variety in the realm of the bodies, even though they're different in terms of the realm that they are designed for. These bodies are designed, these current bodies we have, are designed for this current earthly existence that we have. The resurrection body will be designed for a different kind of existence. For a supernatural existence. For a new heavens and a new earth. For heaven. And so the bodies will be different because they'll be designed for a different realm. For a different kind of existence. They will differ in terms of splendor. They will differ in terms of glory from these bodies. And yet there'll still be continuity, even though there's variety. Continuity, even though there's a real difference in terms of glory. The first analogy he uses, the seed, his emphasis is on mystery and continuity. The second analogy, animate bodies, the emphasis is on variety. Different kinds of flesh, but it's all really flesh. The third analogy of inanimate bodies, the emphasis is on contrasting glory. 
And yet it's all really a physical existence. Paul is saying if you doubt that God has a plan for resurrection, if you doubt that there's a purpose for physical existence, because you can't envision how God will do it or what His purpose would be, you're not paying attention to the variety that the Creator has already exhibited. And you're not paying attention to the Scriptures either. As he comes to verse 42, he demonstrates that as he begins to apply this. He applies these analogies beginning in verse 42. He says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Now he's taken these three analogies and he says, now this is what the resurrection of the dead is like. And he gives us a series of, of rapid contrasts. Nail this down, count on this. When you think about your future believer, this is what your future is going to be like. We don't know yet what, what we're going to be. It's not yet appeared. We know this. When we see Jesus, we're going to be like Him. But these elements He's about to describe will make up what it means to be like Christ. These elements will make up the, the kind of existence we're going to have in the eternity to come. What are we going to be like? Well, what is sown, notice he's still applying now this seed analogy, right? What we have sown is perishable. That ought to be obvious to us. The last funeral you attended, when you think about the body that was put into the ground, that was a perishable body, subject to death, subject to decay. But now get this, what is raised, what is going to be raised from the dead will be imperishable. The body we're going to receive in the resurrection will not be subject to death, will not be subject to destruction, will not be subject to decay. We are going to have an imperishable physical existence. Body and soul with an indestructible body. Anybody aware of your destructibility lately? One day we're going to have an indestructible body. Imperishable. Second, he says it is sown in dishonor. You think about the body that is, that is sown, that body was subject to shame, is the idea. And anyone who's been through a difficult time with someone health-wise can immediately identify with that because we do in this body, we are, we are, unfortunately, we are destined, if the Lord tarries and we all follow the natural course of things and we die, we're subject to certain indignities due to the fact that these bodies have been affected by the fall. And, in fact, every act of sin we commit in the body makes a connection with something that is dishonorable that is shameful these bodies are subject to dishonor but here's the good news the body you're going to receive is going to be raised in glory that is you will be now you will have full capacity to glorify the one who gave you life. We recognize, don't we, that even, even though we've been redeemed, we still function every day because of the fall and its effect on our physical nature. We still function every day at a diminished capacity to glorify God. How many can, can identify with the statement, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak? We want to think in the highest way possible, in the most God-glorifying way possible, but we struggle. Have you ever known a struggle in your prayer life? Have you ever known a struggle in your desires for the Word of God, your desires for worship? In, in the deepest part of your heart, you long for these things, and yet we must admit at times it is a struggle. But one day, we're going to have a physical nature that matches the new us 
and their and our capacities to love God, to obey God, to worship God, to enjoy God will be functioning at the maximum all the time. It's going to be raised in glory. A glorious body. Not one subject to dishonor or shame anymore. Notice the third thing he says. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Weakness. All the frailties we've just mentioned. The weakness of the body. Subject to sickness. Subject to injury. Subject to infection. Subject to death. The flesh is weak. But one day, when we receive our new body, all, all that this means, and we can't conceive of all that it means, but it's going to be raised in power. Martin Luther said that if you imagine the body in the grave absolutely powerless to respond, absolutely powerless to act, he said when you're raised from the dead, what, if you take everything that that powerlessness is and you turn it around, we're going to have that much power to respond, to act, to obey in a way that glorifies God. No more weakness. Verse 44, he says this, It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now, you need to note the word body there, because he's not, he's not saying you have something physical and then something immaterial. That's not what he means by spiritual body. You've got to remember something. The Corinthians, and this is something we've already seen if you've been with us throughout 1 Corinthians, they thought of themselves as pneumatikos, which is to say spiritual. We are spiritual. And they functioned with an over-realized eschatology. They thought, in some sense, they were already living kingdom life. They had already arrived. And Paul is saying here, that there is a body that is fit, that is designed for life as it is right now, this realm. But what awaits you, believer, on the other side of resurrection is a spiritual body, that is a body that's fit for what God has for you in the future. It's not now. It is to be. It's not now, it is to be. There is a spiritual body, he says. If there's a natural body, verse 45, there is also a spiritual body. If God gave us a body fit for life in this realm, God will also give us a body fit for life in what he has destined for us. And this one isn't it. In fact, notice we're going to get to this next week. Look at what he says in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood, as it currently is, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We are headed for an imperishable existence, and this body isn't fit for it. So what comes out of the ground in resurrection is fit for the imperishable life we're going to enjoy. That's what he means by spiritual body. So he's... He's talked to us about from perishable to imperishable, from dishonor to glory, from weakness to power, from natural to spiritual. And then he ends with this thought, from what we have received from Adam to what we have received from Christ. What we have now is what we received from Adam. What we're going to have after the resurrection is what we receive from Christ. Look at what he says in verse 45. By the way, he is, he is now, this is what I mean by scriptural, he goes to Genesis 2-7. In fact, keep your Bible marker here because I want you to see this. We'll come right back. Go to Genesis chapter 2. And this is where he's, he's taking this next statement from. Genesis chapter 2. And look at verse 7. Now Paul, under 
inspiration, by the Spirit's guidance, he is going to not only quote this text, he's going to interpret it. And you'll notice some additional words that he adds in 1 Corinthians 15. For instance, Adam is not found here. But notice what he's going to do with it. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. All right? Now look back at 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul writes in verse 45, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. He became a, literally a living suke. He became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving pneuma. Remember, they envisioned themselves as pneumaticos, spiritual. What's he saying here? He's saying that there are two Adams. There are two representative men. Adam, who was formed by God from the dust of the earth in the garden or placed in the garden. And then you have the Lord Jesus, the last Adam, who came from heaven and took to himself a sinless human nature that we might be redeemed. The first man, he says, this is from Genesis 2-7, became a living soul. The second man became a life-giving spirit, that is, Christ now gives us an existence, a new kind of life, and he's talking about in the physical realm that is spiritual. Adam gave to us this natural body. Christ gives to us, and don't miss this, through his resurrection. He's talking about what Christ has given us on the other side of resurrection. He's talking about the firstborn from the dead. Christ has given us a physical existence that is spiritual in nature. Verse 47, The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Don't read that. Don't read that to to be talking about source. Adam came from the earth and Jesus came from heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's talking now about these two representative men in terms of what they've imparted to those who are from them, in them. He's talking about resurrection and he's saying that Christ's life that he gives us physically, that life didn't come from Adam. It came from heaven. Resurrection is from heaven. That's what he's talking about. Why do you say that, Richard? Well, if you look down at verse 49, he says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. We will share what is heavenly, but it doesn't mean the source of us is heaven. He's talking about physical resurrection life. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. You see that? Who are of heaven. That doesn't mean we came from heaven. No, of heaven in the sense that we share this life, this heavenly life. He's saying this, if you surely, certainly shared the nature, the physical nature of Adam, the first Adam, and we all did, know this, believer, you will certainly share the physical nature of the last Adam, the man who has saved you from your sins. As was, verse 48, the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust, That's all of us. We all share that nature. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. You will. 
Now let me add this and we're going to be done. Do you see there where it says, we shall? You may even have a note in your Bible there. There are some manuscripts that, that have this. Let us. Let us also bear the image of the man of heaven. And those are probably the best manuscripts that, that read that way. It may indeed be the original. And if that is the case, this is actually a powerful message to the Corinthians. And, and what Paul would be saying is this, you don't yet share that image completely. There's something out ahead of you. You think you've arrived, but you need to be exhorted in light of your future to grow right now in taking on the character and the image of Christ whose image one day you will be completely conformed to through resurrection. Live in light of your future, is what he would be saying. Live in light of your future. If this is not what he's saying, if he's saying we shall also bear the image, he's just, he's just nailing down the certainty of it. Just as you've shared in Adam's nature, so you will share in the firstborn from the dead's nature. The last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. The nature, the physical nature that he had post-resurrection. Now I want to ask you as, as we close... Are you excited about your future? Do, do you understand what we're being taught here? Do you understand what we're being told here? That we ought to be living in light of something that is as real as what we know right now in this realm. It's going to be different, but it's not going to be completely disconnected from right now. The body you have right now will be the body that you will have in the future, but it will be transformed. It will be changed just like the seed is transformed in its new form of life. This means that for the believer, death is not something to be feared. Christ took upon himself the sting of death that we don't have to fear death. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. But even that is not the end of the story. For one day, when Christ returns, we will all have a physical nature that matches the new us. One that is fit for a supernatural, imperishable, everlasting existence. That you just get a glimpse of when you look at what was true of the Lord Jesus after his resurrection. Just a glimpse of it. I don't know what all that means, but I know it's going to be exciting. I know it's going to be superior to this. And I also know, though, and this is what he was saying to the Corinthians, it's not yet. Which means we have to learn what it means to, be, to live according to the Spirit in this current realm. And it's those who are led by the Spirit who are the sons of God. And it's those who are being conformed to the image of Christ who will one day be conformed to the image of Christ. Is that you? Are you being led by the Spirit right now? It's going to be a spiritual existence you have one day. You ought to be having a spiritual existence right now. It's not exactly the same, but nonetheless, led by the Spirit. These are the sons of God. Is that you? Is Christ's character being formed in you now because one day you're going to be conformed to Him body and soul? Is that happening right now? I exhort you. We're living in a time. It is moral, spiritual insanity. It's been true since the fall. We know that. But there are, it is still true to say there are times in particular cultures that are better than other times and worse than other times. And we are in a time where sin is bursting out all around us and the world calls you to be conformed to its mold. And I exhort you with all my heart not to live in light of the present, but to live in light of your future. Live submitted to Christ the one who's given you life and will give you life everlasting. Let's pray together.
Father in heaven, we rejoice in light of the future that you have declared to us in your word. We thank you for our Savior who conquered death and the grave, whom you raised from the dead. He is the last Adam. He is our head. And we thank you, Lord, as amazing as it is to us that you have given us our inheritance in him. And what is true of him right now will be true of us one day in terms of what you've chosen to impart to us through him. Lord, one day we look forward to a new physical existence that will match the work that you've done in our, in our soul. Lord, we can't even begin to envision what our future is, but I pray that you would help us to live in light of it, in the hope of resurrection, in the hope of eternal life, that we would live our lives now refusing sin in all of its forms, knowing that it's deceptive and destructive. It is the great lie, and we can know the joy that is everlasting at your right hand. We can know it in our souls even now as we're led by your Spirit. Father, lead us in that way. And help us to exhort each other all the more as we see the day approaching. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed with song.